Please note, today's episode includes discussion of anatomy and death, which some listeners may find upsetting. He would collect bones, skeletons of small animals. His bedroom becomes less and less inviting as time goes on. Join us for another episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects, Stories from Lancaster City Museums. I'm Rachel Roberts and I'm the Collections Registrar for Lancaster City Museums. In this series, we're looking at 100 objects from Lancaster, Morecambe and the surrounding area to celebrate a century of our museums and to find out more about the past and how we relate to it now. Today, we are revisiting someone who has appeared in our podcast before, but through him we are going back over 120 million years to a world of dinosaurs and into a hotbed of 19th century scientific thinkers. Today's object is a model of an iguanodon, as envisaged by Richard Owen. The model is made of metal, and is nowhere near life-size, being under 50 centimetres across. It isn't painted, but instead has been left the bronze colour of the metal. It is very detailed, with teeth, claws and textured skin, But although it looks like we imagine a dinosaur might, it would be very difficult for a modern viewer to tell that it was an iguanodon. It walks on all fours with a long tail dragging along the ground behind it. Its neck is short, leading to a small, beaked head, and on its nose is a distinctive horn. For anyone who knows what we now believe an iguanodon looks like, it is virtually unrecognisable. We spoke to Peter Wade, who started by giving us an insight into the iguanodon model, and how ideas on dinosaurs at the time it was made shaped the way it looks. Well, it looks like what they thought an iguanodon looked like in the 19th century, but ideas have changed over time. So the 19th century idea was for a a sort of lumbering heavyweight that would look a bit like big animals that we have Now, so elephants, rhinoceroses, all of them big beasts on all fours, uh, rather slow, uh, and that's slow physically and also a bit slow in their their wits (laughs) as well. Now, our thinking has changed radically, so they're no longer slow and lumbering, they're rather speedy, And the speed is because they are upright. They go on two legs, not four. So they have large rear legs and then rather puny front legs, which are for handling things, really, as opposed to running. So rather a different picture. And also, I think the the old idea of the iguanodon had a little kind of horn on the nose. And now we realise that it didn't at all and that this uh, uh, little bit of a horn it was elsewhere on the, on the body of the thing peter explained that iguanodon was one of several species which had been discovered in the middle of the 19th century and the impact that this had on the designer of the model richard owen there were several dinosaurs that were slowly being uncovered by no means the number now so we we now have huge numbers of these things But in Owen's day, they had relatively few fossils to go on, although Owen himself was obsessed with anatomy and studying living creatures and and then also having a look at the fossil remains of these ancient creatures as well. So he was a very important character and he had an encyclopedic knowledge of anatomy. And that goes right back to his childhood, which is here in Lancaster. And he would collect bones. He would have skeletons of small animals. His bedroom becomes less and less inviting as time goes on, because more and more of these things begin to uh, fill the shelves. Um, And then he's able to pursue an apprenticeship in the castle and actually in the in the hospital within the castle and that offers another opportunity for collecting 
human remains in this case, and in particular he wants to get skulls. And so he goes to quite elaborate means, uh, and probably quite illegal ones <laughs> as well, to go to the hospital mortuary at dead of night, remove the skull, bribe the people who are going to screw down the coffin lid so they turn a blind eye to what's happened. And so he's able to get one or two prized possessions like this for the collection. So he fills his bedroom uh, uh, on Dalton Square and then as life goes on he's still filling not just rooms but entire buildings with his collection and in the end the Natural History Museum in London is founded largely to house Richard Owen's anatomy collection and uh, indeed the figure of Richard Owen looks down surveying his museum and his collections in the form of a statue in the Natural History Museum today. He gets his skeletons, his sources, whatever they are, uh, from a whole variety of locations. So he goes to study anatomy at Edinburgh University at the time of the body snatchers. And this is where you have grave robbery going on. You have the battlefields of Europe being scoured for corpses and, and anything in decent condition being shipped back to, to run the schools of anatomy. Then he would contact, say, London Zoo. And if they had an animal that was looking a bit poorly, <laughs> they thought wouldn't make it, could he please have the the body. I think here in the museum there is actually a portrait of Richard Owen as a young man. They're quite unusual showing him as a young man, but there he is. I think he's got a hand on the skull of a gorilla, and in the background you can see there are leopard skins and things draped over the furniture. So the more you look at this, the more you begin to feel a bit uneasy about what the, what the picture's actually showing. But it, it is the reality of Richard Owen. The first time you learn about Richard Owen, his name is likely to be immediately followed by the fact that he invented the word dinosaur. We asked Peter if Owen really did come up with this word. Yes, he did. So um, it's 1841 uh, and he writes about his fossil discoveries and, of course, he, he needs a general term for the creatures that he's uh, discovered, as it were. And so he comes up with this word, dinosaurus, I think it is, to start with, which means terrible lizard. Which is right, really, because he's, he's looking at contemporary lizards and the similarities between them and the, and, the, and the fossil version. So that's how it comes about in 1841 and this was, was actually celebrated in a set of stamps on the 150th anniversary, Owen's uh, Dinosauria. Our model relates to a bigger project which Owen was involved with in 1852. So we asked Peter to tell us more about that time and whether this was the only version of the model. Of that scale... This, as far as we know, is the only one. However, there are larger versions of these and, remarkably, they are still with us all these years on because the little model really was a study for something larger and the something larger was a life-sized, concrete version of the then-known dinosaurs. And this was for the gardens and grounds of the Crystal Palace in London. The sculptor was a man called Waterhouse Hawkins. Splendid name, sounds like a pirate. So he created the models, he created the small version, the maquettes, and then uh, supervised the construction of the large-scale ones. And before the Iguanodon was, was finished, Owen held a very special dinner. It was actually a dinosaur dinner. It was a celebration of his and other people's discoveries. And so within this half-finished model, they set up a dining table. Owen at the 
head of this, various assistants dotted around the table. They did this on a New Year's Eve, so to try and keep warm, <laughs> they had to have a tent over the over the whole thing. Within this as well were named some of the people who'd helped find all the fossils. <laughs> But Richard Owen did not operate alone. In fact, he was just one of a number of eminent scientists that were linked to Lancaster at this time, forming a community of inventors and thinkers working in a wide range of subjects. If you go round the base of Queen Victoria's statue, you will find the great and the good of the Victorian era. And most of these figures are national figures, but not to do with Lancaster particularly. However... A group of scientists that are shown are very closely connected with Lancaster. So Richard Owen is there. There's the young version of Owen and then there's the old version of Owen. Some people actually, possibly even knowing himself, thought he lived too long because he lived to a great age and some of his ideas when he was young were overturned, especially by the coming of Darwinism as well. So he he was a bit old-fashioned in the end. But he's there, as you'd expect. Sir William Turner, who was an anatomist. William Hewell, one of his words, scientist, but he also came up with ion, cathode, anode. We have Sir Edward Frankland, who was a chemist, and he basically invented uh, what we know today as valency, the numerical rules by which atoms combine together to make molecules. So it's absolutely fundamental to uh, chemistry. As another inventor of a word, and indeed the concept of a scientist itself, we asked Peter to finish off by elaborating on William Hewell. William Hewell, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, a clergyman who was also an academic. He was a a polymath. Uh, He knew everything there was to know about, well, everything. There's a story about his friends at Cambridge who would dine together And the conversation always finally focused on William Hewell because he he just knew so much more. So his dining companions conspired to try and think of a subject that they would know about and William Hewell would not. And so they came up with Chinese music. There they were. They started off this conversation. William Hewell unusually was very, very quiet, and they thought, ha-ha, at last, we've found something he doesn't know about. Well, their knowledge of Chinese music, of course, was rather limited, and so eventually the conversation began to flag. William Hewell then clears his throat and announces, well... In my uh, pamphlet on Chinese music, I wrote blah, 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 and off he went, you know, into a a good hour of lecturing them all on Chinese music. So from that point on, they they just gave up. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed this episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects, and hope that you will join us for our other episodes where we will be discussing everything from newspapers to Neolithic axes.